Good morning. Um, thanks, Lindsay, for the introduction, and, and thanks to Peak Care and Quatsip for making this event possible. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place and pay my respects to Elders past and present. What I'd like to do today is to set the context and to share with you some evidence and data that, that we've been using. One of the things that, that we realised this time last year was that we were working in a rapidly changing landscape in child protection and we were seeing vastly different risk patterns coming through with our families. So we decided that the, the best way to build our practice in this area was to base it on evidence and to look at our data. And that's what I'd like to share with you this morning. Um, it's, it's the most important thing that we will do going forward is that we base our practice and our arguments on facts and, and not on fads. So what I'd like to show you now is when we started to look at when we started to look at our data we found that for the first time one in three children that were coming into ongoing intervention during the 12 months to March 2017 had one or both parents who were current users of methamphetamines and the impact that methamphetamines have on child risks were that 55% of those families that were presenting to us had neglect issues. So they were either children not being fed or had their nappies changed, you know, things like that, just the basic necessities of life. For 31% we were seeing emotional harm. For 13% we were seeing actual physical harm and for 1% we were seeing sexual abuse. And that's just in that cohort where the parents were ICE users. And these figures to us were extremely concerning, but they highlight the complexity of issues that are being faced by those who struggle with an addiction. And they also highlight the direct impact that the effect of this drug has on our most vulnerable members of our community, our children. In 75% of cases, the methamphetamine type was ice. For the majority of parents, around 60% where parental ice use was recorded, it was reported that they'd only started using the drug in the last 12 months. Our data shows that ice wasn't a presenting issue for families known to the child protection system 10 years ago. Parents known to the child protection system are now using ice more frequently than they drink alcohol. So 36 instances of ice substance misuse per 100 households compared to 32 instances of alcohol abuse. Over 30% of parental ice use was in households located within two corridors. So this is where we're actually seeing the worst effects. And that was a corridor between Ipswich North and Brisbane North to Caloundra and the Gold Coast, including Beanley. So they were the biggest concentrations. A further 30% A further 30% were located in Rockhampton to Aikenvale, including Townsville and Emerald, Gympie, Miraburra and Bundaberg, and Springfield to Mount Gravatt, including Browns Plains. So there's not many places of Queensland that haven't been affected, and it isn't just an urban issue. So the characteristics that we're finding in parental ICE households are that 57% of children who have a parent using ice were under five, including unborn children. What else do we find in parental ice use our households? Parents are more likely to be experiencing multiple complex issues. So 77% of them have a criminal history as opposed to 56% for our other child protection households. 
73% of them have a current or previously diagnosed mental illness as opposed to 57% for other households. 71% have experienced domestic and family violence in the past year as opposed to 57% for other households. 18% are homeless as opposed to 10% for other households. So what this is showing us is it's, it's not just the addiction, it's all of those other complex issues that come with that addiction. And this is an indication of the complexity in which our sector is working. The most serious harm type that we saw was neglect. And that's when children are not getting food, water, shelter. They can be malnourished, hungry, suffering developmental growth delays, not being taken for their regular medical or dental checks. There's also supervisory neglect. So these are children that are pretty much left to their own devices. So sometimes toddlers are left in baths or with older children supervising them. They have access to swimming pools and other areas of water. They um, are co-sleeping in very unsafe situations. There are, there are all sorts of issues about supervisory neglect. We also know that sometimes these children are not having their proper immunisations, that they're not taken to the doctor when they're sick or injured, and they may not have a safe home environment. So sometimes the drugs are actually cooked in the home, and, and as you know, that that's, they're very volatile, so children are exposed to the, the fumes from that, that process, as well as all the paraphernalia. They're also exposed to syringe use, um, and often syringes are left around the houses. We also know that children are suffering emotional and physical, as well as a small percentage of, of sexual harm. And sometimes that's not by the parent themselves, but it's about the visitors to that house. So the people who are also coming into that household to use drugs. Some of the things, the, the cognitive effects of ICE on these parents are poor judgment, confusion, irritability, apathy, paranoia, increased violence, depression, all the sorts of things that are dangerous to children, particularly those little ones that are under five that we've been talking about. So who's letting us know that these families using ICE need help? The good news is, is that the message that everyone should be playing their part is getting out and a lot of the referrals that we see to child safety are actually from family and friends and particularly grandparents are an, are an important cohort there as well. It's a far reaching problem. So what are we doing um, in the department and what are we trying to do to improve outcomes? We've amended our child safety policy and procedures. So now we have drug testing. <clears throat> I mean, we always had drug testing, but if we have children now who are on an intervention with parental agreement, it's part of the deal that that parent, if there's drugs involved, will subject themselves to mandatory drug tests. If, if they won't, if they won't agree to that, then an IPA is off the table. We've invested in specialised ICE training resources for frontline workers. And these include child safety workers, housing and public works employees, and we're hoping to also roll that out to DV supporters. We're also very keen to make those um, resources available to the wider sector. It's not a knowledge sharing problem, it's an IT sharing problem which we're working on. So we're hoping to get that to you as soon as we can. We're also employing a specialist advisor on drugs and alcohol, and this will be a person who um, comes to us from Queensland Health, who's a specialist in this area, and they'll rotate through that position every six months, and they'll become part of our 
practice and quality improvement team. And they'll be, advi they'll be available to give advice on, on options available, treatment options um, available for families, but also to help us understand the impact of ICE. We also have funding of 8.9 million over four years for 20 new nurses to improve early intervention and identification of families for who drugs are an issue. And they'll be based with our um, Family and Child Connects. We're also working um, with $5.4 million over the next four years for 12 um, CSOs to be based in hospital and health districts. And they'll also be a conduit between treatment options and health options for families impacted by ICE. One of the things that Minister Fenderman announced just recently was that we're also piloting a family recovery unit delivered by Lives Lived Well at their Logan House Recovery Centre to support families involved in the child protection system and to overcome ICE issues so that they can stay together or reunite. So I hope what you've been able to see today from, from this short presentation is that ICE is having a devastating impact on parents' abilities to safely care for their children. While it's not the only presenting problem, it's an escalating problem and it's something that's escalated rapidly in the last couple of years. It's a huge challenge, not just for child protection, but for police, for other community services. And there's a clear need for us to all work together on this. This is not something that one agency, one organisation can solve on their own. It's going to take a concerted effort. And I think today where we've brought together some of the, the key thinkers in this, in this sector, hopefully we can debate some of these issues and look at ways that we can better work together and better support our families and our vulnerable children. So I want to thank you for, for um, inviting me to speak today and I hope that that evidence has been useful to you in helping inform your decision, your discussions later today. Thank you.